Good morning and uh, welcome again. This uh, class is a review of chapter four in your textbook. It's for Weld 1840. Um, by now, those of you that are watching this film have already gone through 1755, 1760, and probably 1950 as well. So that's prepared you for what we're going to be doing here. Um, here we start to get into a little bit of the criticality of wells and how important it is to watch what you're doing and to be your own best inspector. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how the five basic joints and how the joints are all put together and some of the nomenclature, that is the terminology that is related to uh, what you're doing now, uh, groove welding plate. So open your books to page 127. And I'm going to start the, uh, about halfway down the column. And it, see, it says, uh, although weld design and selection are the responsibility of the engineering department, this does not mean that the welder should not be concerned about weld joint design and welding procedures. Recognition of the requirements of, for a particular type of weld will lead to work of higher quality and accuracy. It is the welder's responsibility to understand the fundamental joint design and the welding procedures. They've referred to that twice now. When you're out there in the field, any work that you do, you're going to have a welding procedure to do that. And what that is, that procedure tells you how you're going to make that weld. And on that procedure, it will have a, a, a schematic drawing of the joint that you're going to be welding to. As you go through this class, you're going to learn more about welding procedures. And those of you that are going for your degree will have to take welding inspection technology at the end of this course. It'll be one of your capstone classes. Uh, and we're going to talk in depth about what a welding procedure is and how to interpret that information. You have to know that out in the field. A welder who has a practical understanding of the values of weld joint design and the characteristics of different types of welds can be of great aid and assistance to the supervisory personnel and the engineering department. Best results are obtained where this kind of cooperation is found. Uh, flip the page and you'll uh, top of the page says types of joints. There are only five basic types of joints. Uh, let me back up one. Five basic types. The butt joint, the corner joint, the T joint, the lap joint, the edge joint. That's all there are. You've already done the T joint, and I've talked about the lap joint. Uh, we'll go over all of these real quickly. Know these five joints. Know what they are. Uh, you'll probably find them on your test. This is a butt joint, and this would be a square groove butt joint because you can see the edges have not been prepared in any manner. The shaded area is the root of the joint. It's that entire area, regardless of the thickness. It could be two inches thick and eight inches long, and that would still be considered the root. And a butt joint is a joint between two members aligned in approximately the same plane. Now, this is a little different from a lap joint, but we'll get to that in a second. You can see that difference. These are some of the grooves that are associated with a butt joint, and your book will talk about those in a minute. A bevel groove, a flare bevel groove, a flare V groove, a J groove, a square groove, that's the picture we just looked at, a U groove, a V groove, this is what you're going to be doing in weld 1840, an edge flange, and a braze joint. This is a corner joint, and in this case, uh, it completely overlaps. So this would be called a butting member because it butts into this other member here. And again, all of this area is shaded, so all of this area is the root. Now sometimes you'll get a corner joint where this member just comes up right, right here and it doesn't form any kind of, a, of an area root, but this point where the two edges would come together would then be considered the root. And you would try to get a full penetration weld in there and fill the entire joint up. Defi definition of this is a joint between two members located approximately at right angles to each other in the form of an L. These are some of the welds that are associated with those. Typically it's a fillet weld is what you'll do and you'll do a V groove sometimes. That's when the the edges of the two come together. Now we have a T joint. You've done thousands of these so you know what a T joint is and you can see this shaded area here is considered the root. Now whenever you put your welds in here you always try to break down that edge to get full penetration and fusion on the root. Our definition is a joint between two members located at approximately right angles to each other in the form of a T. T joint welds, fillet weld, 
uh, bevel groove and so forth. Uh, we'll get into these a little bit later on in the, in the text. Here's your lap joint and you can see this differs from a, from a butt joint because the two members are, are actually lying on one another. And it says a joint between two overlapping members in parallel planes. You'll remember a butt joint were two members lying in parallel planes, but these are overlapping members lying in a parallel plane. Again, here's some of the welds that, you, that can be associated with lap joints. Fillet welds the, the most typical. Edge joint, two pieces coming together. And so this entire area then becomes, becomes the root. It's considered the root although you may only weld around the outer edge. A joint between the edges of two or more parallel or nearly parallel members. These are the uh, welds that are associated with that. Bevel groove, flare bevel groove, flare V groove, J groove. I don't expect you to remember all of those. Typically you're going to do something like a seam weld or an edge weld on those. Uh, if one member is prepared you may have to do one of these other welds as well. Uh, before we get on to the next slide, let's go to your book and where it says four types of welds. Bead welds, uh, you know what that is, you simply strike an arc and run a single pass bead. Uh, a bead weld would be something, it might be considered a surfacing weld. When you guys, uh, guys and gals built that pad and you laid beads on like this, this was called a surfacing weld or a cascade sequence and these were all welding beads. So those are bead welds. Fillet welds, you've done thousands of those. You know what a fillet weld is. Uh, there's some important nomenclature, terminology that goes with fillet welds that we're going to get into in a little bit. Uh, groove welds, as I said before, this is what you're going to be doing now. Uh, there's V groove, U groove. Uh, we'll see some edge, some edge uh, preparations later. The groove, the type of groove gets its name from the, from the edge preparation. Since you're going to be doing single V, that's what they're called, single V grooves, like so, sometimes you're going to start out with a backing strip. So you're going to be doing a single V groove weld with backing. Once, it, once we take that away, then it's still called a single V groove, but now it's without backing. So it, it, the term is with or without. If we change this slightly, and we put a J on here, now we have a single, this would be square, sorry. This would be called a J groove weld. If we put a second J preparation on this, now we have a U groove. If we took it and we put a J on each edge, this would be called a double U groove, and so forth. You can see how simple and straightforward is. Once you understand uh, the terminology, it's really easy to picture how these would all go together. Okay, on the next page, plug welds. Uh, I have a drawing. I have, I have this same slide. We'll get to it in a second. But I want to draw your attention to figure 4.5. The very top picture shows slot welds. And all that is, it, they drill a hole, drill a hole, and remove the metal in between so it's a, a stretched out uh, circle. That's all it is. And that creates a slot and they'll weld that up. And they'll use that to weld two members, two overlapping members together. So if you remember back here we looked at the lap weld. Well, sometimes lap welds will be joined together with slot welds. Uh, the one below it is a plug weld. Now on these plug welds, they, uh, they, they've simply drilled a hole straight through and welded them up. And then C is a fillet weld. Um, the difference between B and C is in, in, in C, the fillet welds, they only went around the, the circumference of the, of the drill hole, whereas in the plug welds, they filled up the body, the whole volume of the plug. So read about those. Drop down to where it says uh, weld size and strength groove welds. Highlight this, a groove weld is measured and sized by its depth of penetration uh, uh, and fusion into the joint. The size does not include reinforcement of the face or root of the weld. Groove welds are generally referred to as partial joint penetration or complete joint penetration. If a groove weld symbol has no size reference, then it should be considered to be a, a complete joint penetration. You're going to be doing complete joint penetration welds. We're going to talk more about those in, uh, as we go through this lecture.
uh, joint terminology. Uh, if you look back on page, uh, the, the previous page, figure 4.4 4, uh, and uh, figure 4.3, you see we have joint root, root face, root edge, uh, groove face, bevel angle, depth of bevel, groove angle, groove radius, root opening, and then edge shapes. Um, square, single or double bevel, uh, round, whatever it might be. And then correspondingly, if you look at figures 4.3 and 4.4, you see on the fillet welds, they're telling us they, uh, they have bold lines going, pointing out what the face of it is, what the toe, what the root, and what the leg of the fillet welds are on T-joints. You should be very familiar with those terms already. The weld root uh, is where the two pieces come together and you try to get your depth of fusion. We'll talk about that uh, terminology here in a little bit. Figure 4.4, again it shows the weld, the toe, the root, and the face reinforcement. It, they don't call it buildup. Uh, any metal in excess of what it takes to fill the joint is considered and called correctly face reinforcement. Any weld metal that extends through the root and is in excess of what is required to fill the joint on the root side is called root reinforcement. Um, here are some examples of, of uh, root joints. They talk about root joints and you can see that here is our T. So this would be the root on the T. Again, it's the shaded area. This, would, this is a double V, a double V groove. And so this would be the root area. And you see it's got a little bit of a land in there, a little bit of a flat space. So that entire flat space is the root. Here's the same one without a land. And so it, it just comes to a point. If you looked at this in cross section, there, there, there'd only be a little tiny dot right there, which would represent the root. Again, here's a square groove butt joint. And you can see the shaded area which is your root. Here's our lap joint and you can see this shaded area which is our root. And then finally back to what you're all doing in Weld 1840, a single V groove and this right here where these two pieces come and meet, that is called your root. Now on these of course when you get to the open butt portion of this you're going to grind a land on there, a little flat space just like this one has and so you'll have an area instead of a point and that, but that is still called your root, appropriately called your root. Uh, these are the different types of, my slides may not be exactly in order with your text because I took these from another class, um, but these are single groove welds. Uh, let me see, right here is the single V groove. This is the one that you're going to be doing in this class. Here's one that's been, uh, this is a square groove that's been welded up. You're going to use, uh, if you're going to do a square groove weld, you don't want to do it on metal more than one quarter of an inch thick because you won't get sufficient penetration. You'll leave a little uh, root opening there, crank your machine up, and you can get all the way through up to about a quarter of an inch thick piece of steel. But beyond that, you don't want to use this kind of a configuration. This is a single bevel. They've only prepared one member. One piece has got a bevel on it, just like the material you guys are using, but the other one is square, so they call that a single bevel. Now, if you bring two of those bevels together, it forms a single V, which is what you're welding. Here's the single V with a backing strip, which is also what you're welding in this class. Here we have a single J groove. Now making a J groove is a little more difficult because uh, sometimes it has to be machined to get that J configuration, but other times if you get good with an air carbon arc, you can take, a, take an air carbon arc and form one member uh, with the configuration of a J on there. You can actually go down the edge and put a groove on there without burning all the way through and make a, make a J groove. In fact, I know one school that makes this a test. You have to be able to do that. Here we have a single U groove. And if you see, if you remember then, all they had to do was do a, do a J on each side. They could take an air arc and they could actually take these two and tack them together, butt them up, and then run down the center of that with, a, with an air carbon arc and gouge out that metal until they got to the depth that they wanted and they could form a U groove. And then here, this is a flare. This is a single flare bevel. Now, if you look at this piece of steel here, you can see it's circumferenced. It's rounded on both these edges here. So this is why they call it a flare, because one piece is square, but the other one flares away from it. And here's two pieces of, of that flare, that circumferenced or rounded material, forming a, 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 a single flare groove weld. So it's flaring out on both sides. So that's where that term of a flare groove comes, come from. 
the, those are uh, usually only associated with structural type of weldments. Okay, parts of a weld. Let's see. Turn to page 130 because we have a little bit more information on that. Look at figure 4.9 and you'll see on the top is the face. It's called the face. It's not called the cap. It's not, well, as you're doing the work, you can call it your cap, but when you're referring to it in terms of welding inspection, it's the face. Uh, the toe, of course, is that area of the weld metal that meets the parent metal. The face reinforcement is that amount of metal above the weld, uh, above, above the base metal, metal in excess of what it takes to fill the joint. Same thing with the root, that's the uh, metal above uh, the base metal that is necessary to fill the joint. The root surface, uh, well the root surface here I think would be analogous to your root face. If you look at it, they, they have a slight land on there and, and that would be your root surface. The weld root is where it penetrates through the complete joint penetration. The bead, we've talked about a bead, now a back weld, um, a back weld is where you would go ahead and you would make your weld from the front side. Here, let me just put it on the board real quick, make it clear in your mind. The terms are a little confusing. Back weld and backing weld are a little con confusing. But here's what you're doing right now. So if you, if you want to do a back weld, you're going to fill this up completely. Then you're going to gouge this out and make another weld here. So you have back welded your primary weld. However, if you want to do a backing weld, then you're going to go ahead and you're going to put this one on first, and then you're going to fill this one up. So it's a, the difference is a back weld and a backing weld. Okay, And, and people sometimes get that confused, uh, but just think about it. From the side you're standing on, which weld are you going to make first? If you're going to fill the joint up first, then that means you're going to go around to the other side and put on a back weld. But if you're going to fill that other side up first, then that's considered a backing weld. Of course, you can't do backing welds in, in pipe, so this would only associate, be associated with uh, um, plate. Next, we have a spacer. A lot of times, and I'll show you this when we get into a pipe, uh, you use a spacer ring to hold two pieces of material apart but it, while you're fitting it up. And then the heat affected zone, if you look again at figure 4.9, the heat, look at the toe of the weld. The, the, the heat affected zone it occurs at the toe. And it's that area adjacent to the toe, right next to the toe, that has been changed. You changed its mechanical properties due to the heat of welding, but you didn't melt it. So it's that area right adjacent to the toe that's been, that has been changed from the heat of welding, but it didn't get hot enough to melt. Um, here's a better picture of it. Weld face, point, pointing to the face, weld toe down here, uh, root uh, face reinforcement, root reinforcement, weld root is down here, uh, back weld and backing weld. You, this, I don't think you can see those very clearly. Um, this is the back weld, and here's a backing weld. And the only way you can tell the difference is if it's a back weld, it's got a, you can see the entire outline of the, of the weld. And if it's a backing weld, then you can see the entire outline of the one he made from the, from the face, from the face side. This picture is in your book, or something very similar to it. Flip back to page 129. This is figure 14-7 in your book. And these are fusion terms. So when we talk about depth of fusion, this is what we're talking about. I don't think you actually have this little T-joint one in here, uh, so this will be a bonus for you. But let's look at figure 4.7 first. And you can see we've got a single V-groove, just like you're doing, but would this be a back weld or a backing weld? So ask yourself that. Well, if you can see the entire thing, that means that this was applied second. So that would make it a back weld. Correct. And then your depth of fusion, 
is from the fusion face. Now before you start the weld, this is called your groove angle or your groove face. But once the weld has been completed, now it's become the fusion face because the heat of welding has melted it and you have fused into it. And then your depth of fusion is the distance that your, your weld metal has penetrated into the base metal. And the outline boundary is called your weld interface. And if, as the name implies, it's where the, the greatest extent of your weld metal into the parent metal. And so your depth of fusion here would be whatever it would measure out to be. Over here on the T-joints, uh, if we've done macro wedge examinations of, on any of the T-joints that, that you people did in the previous classes, you would have seen an outline of your depth of fusion into the parent metal. And you can see we have the same, we use the same terms here. This would be your, your surface prior to welding. After welding, it becomes the fusion face. And then your depth of fusion is the distance that it penetrates into the parent metal. Um, let's see, this is figure 4.3 in your book. And this is, this is back on page 128. So just glance back there. Root, leg, face, toe. Spacer, here's a spacer that they put in this V-groove. Uh, weld metal and the heat affected zone. Here's a, here's a schematic of what I was talking about, the heat affected zone. You can see here this dotted line is your groove face. And then it shows your depth of fusion, how far you burned into the parent metal. But then it shows a shaded area here extending beyond that depth to where that heat has changed the mechanical properties of the parent metal. So you need to know these terms. They will probably be on your book, uh, pardon me, probably be on your test. Here's some more parts of welds. Weld root, weld bead, and dilution percent. I don't expect you to, to know that. Um, it's a calculation, a calculation of dilution from cross-sectional area of the, of the weld bead. Uh, Dilution is the depth of fusion and how well did it, did, it, did it penetrate into the base metal and how well did the weld metal dilute or mix with the parent metal. Okay, that's all of that for, for the moment. So let's go to our textbooks. Let's see how your textbook describes dilution. My book's a little bit different from yours, and it doesn't. It does not give us a definition. Okay. Now, we're back on page 130. Sill welds. I'm reading from the second paragraph, which reads, many welders believe that high reinforcement increases the strength of the welded joint. So if you, that's over welding. Remember anything that is in excess of what it takes to fill the joint is over welding. It's excess weld reinforcement. Some people think, well, I'll put another pass on there to make it stronger. Not true. It actually weakens it. This belief is not true. Not only is excessive reinforcement above the allowable limit a waste of time and weld metal, but it also decreases the working strength of the joint because of concentrations of stresses at the toe of the weld. The uh, steep entrance angle greatly reduces the endurance limit under fatigue loading. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but basically what they're talking about, if you have, let's go back to this drawing here. If you, if you over weld it, if you put some more weld metal on there and you build it up really big. When he's talking about, I've never used the term steep, steep angle before, but he's talking about this, the edges of the weld. Whenever you have vibratory stresses moving through your part, you want it to flow smoothly through that part. If you have a, a steep angle here on your cap, that creates what we call a stress riser. Now you're going to hear that term a lot, and you may find that on your, on your test. A stress riser. A stress riser could be a lot of things. It could be overlap, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. It could be undercut. or it could be excessive weld reinforcement. So what happens is these vibratory stresses, instead of flowing smoothly through the weldment, it's like they act like ocean waves crashing against a breakwater. And they're gonna pound against this stress riser here until they form a crack. 
and typically the crack will be here in the heat affected zone right along the, the edge of the toe of the weld in that parent metal that has been changed from the heat of welding but didn't melt. So the only way you can fix that is to, first of all, you don't want to do it at all. Don't over weld. But if you do over weld, then you have to come in here with a grinder and you have to fix this thing. And you have to take that sharp edge condition off of there and smooth it out so that you have a smooth transition so that those vibratory stresses will flow through that cap. So don't over weld. You're not doing anybody any good and the weld could fail much sooner than it would ever would if you didn't do it that way. Um, go to the next column. It says the width of a groove weld should not be more than one quarter of an inch greater than the width of the groove face. And I've probably talked with each of you about this already. If you're making this weld, too many pictures. Let me draw another one. If you're making this weld, and you're filling this thing up, you don't want to come more than, more than is necessary onto the parent metal here with your weld metal. Because the wider you go, the more stresses you put into the weld. So the book says not more than a quarter of an, of an inch wider than the groove. So that means you could put an eighth of an inch maximum onto each side. That's not very much. About the thickness of a dime. Um, that's why I say watch the edge of the puddle flow over and melt those edges down, but don't go any farther than you have to. And here's why. Metal deposited beyond the groove face is a waste of time and filler metal. It also adds to the overall heat input and increases uh, resultant residual stresses. Complete joint penetration welds are usually designed to possess the maximum physical characteristics of the base metal. Most weld metal will overmatch the strength of a base metal. Those complete joint penetration welds that meet code requirements, such as the butt joint in piping, must have better physical properties than those used in the fabrication of non-code production components. The idea is to have a weld that is fit for its intended purpose. The minimum size called for on the welding symbol must be made for these groove welds to fit their intended purpose. So if, if you're working from a print and it says we want a half inch fillet weld on this plate over here, give it a half inch. Don't give it five eighths. Don't give it three quarters. You're, you're over welding. Next page, fillet welds. The most common weld used in industry is the fillet weld. Fillet welds can be as strong as or stronger than the base metal if the weld is the correct size and the proper welding techniques are used. Uh, when discussing the size of fillet welds, the weld contour must first be determined. Contour is the shape of the face of the weld. Uh, figure 412 shows a cross-sectional profile of the three types of fillet welds. Uh, we have flat, convex, and concave. Um, I've got some pictures of that if I can find it. I think I might have these. Okay, here we go. Convex and concave. Convex, concave. Um, let me get another picture here. Here we go. Here's a, here's a better one. This is a lot closer to what you, what's in your book. I'm looking at the bottom of, of page 131, figure 412. Uh, this is a, a convex fillet weld. Well, it's convex because it's, it's a little bit rounded. Okay. Now, the size of the fillet weld is this triangle that can fit inside. And there's some terms that you should be familiar with. Theoretical throat, effective throat, an actual throat. And I believe, yes, they, these are in your book. Now, if you look at this, if it's a convex fillet weld, the leg size and the, and the fillet weld size are the same. But here we have a concave fillet weld. Now, here the face of it's sunk in. And that reduces the size of this triangle. So that means that the leg size and the size of the triangle are different. So that's something you're going to want to have to remember. You may see that on your test. So let's go back to our first slide. So the actual throat and the effective throat and the theoretical throat, you can look at these. The theoretical throat is the one that the engineer uses in his calculations. Now the actual throat is from the face of the weld out here all the way down to its point of deepest penetration, which is here, into the parent metal. The effective throat comes from 
the, the maximum size of the triangle to the greatest point of, of penetration. Okay? So those are the differences. You can read about these in your book too. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. So on a convex fillet weld, well, we, the, the picture we just looked at, the leg, si the leg and size of the weld are equal. It has a convex uh, face to it. The uh, actual throat, effective throat, and theoretical throat, these are things you'll need to remember. On a concave one, you have a leg, you have a size which is less than the leg length. It's sunken in, it's concave. It has actual effective, the actual and effective throats are equal. Let me go back to that here in a second. And then, the then you have your theoretical throat. Oops, wrong way. So here, the actual and theoretical throats are not equal, but here they are. Uh, pardon me, actual throat and effective throats are, are the same. Because th now you're coming from the face to the greatest point of uh, penetration, whereas here, the, because it's concave or convex, the face is further out. I keep punching the wrong button. So, understand those terms. Uh, fillet weld convexity, let me see before we go any further. Okay, there are some things I want you to highlight in your book on page 131. Staying in that first column where it says the, a convex fillet weld, that's in bold. Highlight that sentence, it says the size of a convex fillet weld is generally, generally considered to be the length of the leg reference. Um, on concave and flat contour fillet welds, the size and the leg are the same, and this is what the design engineer specifies on the welding symbol. And let's see. Flip the page. Uh, second paragraph in that first column, it says, all three types of fillet profiles, the concave, the flat, or convex, are widely used. The position of welding, process, type of consumables, type of joint and job requirements are the factors that determine the type of fillet contour to be specified. Then in the next column, you have your abbreviations of what the theoretical throat is, the effective throat is, and the actual throat is. So read those and study those pictures of uh, uh, figure 4.14, which is the concave one, and then figure 14.15, which would be uh, a convex one. So study those. Then on the next page, uh, 133, highlight the paragraph that reads, a weld or weld joint is no stronger than its weakest point, just like in a, in a, uh, in a chain. And I may have spoken to you about uh, the, the throat of your weld, the through thickness. The throat is the through thickness. And, and in the previous classes that you've taken, I may have talked to you about consistency. Is it uniform? Is it the same width? Is it the same thickness? The, the same throat? It's because if the throat is different, that means where it's, where it's thinner, there's not as much weld metal, um, so it's not as strong as the rest of the weld. So therefore, it, that would be the weakest part. Um, going back to your book, it says, even though the weld in figure 416B would appear to be much stronger it will not support more stress than the weld in figure 416A. It may even support less stress to the additional, uh, due to the additional uh, residual stresses built up in the joint that is overwelded. If you look right below where we're reading, uh, you can look at A, and they have one quarter inch thick plate, and they've put a one quarter inch thick fillet weld on there. And that's a good rule of thumb. Don't make the fillet weld any bigger than the thickness of the material you're welding. But then look at B. They're still welding on one quarter inch thick plate, but now they put a half inch on there. They've overwelded it. That's too much. They, they're, they're defeating their own purpose by putting too much metal on there. Uh, continuing reading now, it says, when metals of different thicknesses are to be joined, such as welding a one quarter inch thick plate onto a one half inch thick plate, uh, then the general rule for the fillet weld size is that the size of the fillet weld leg should equal the, the thickness of the metal being welded. Uh, so since you have two different size, thicknesses of metal, you may want to put different thicknesses or sizes of, of fillet weld legs on those metals. And that's what, uh, what we're seeing in, in uh, 
in the next picture in figure 4, 417. And those, of course, are called unequal, unequal fillet legs. So make sure you understand that term. And that, if, it, if you're working from a print, that will probably be, um, that is probably where you'll run into that figure. If it doesn't say, then you go with the smaller member. Just make it the size of the smaller member. Okay, let's see, flip the page. Read about continuous welds. Um, basically, a, a continuous weld is, say we wanted to, to weld a T-joint, a continuous weld would be one that went the entire length, okay, continuous weld. Uh, an intermittent weld, as the name implies, is going to be intermittent. Sometimes you don't need to weld the entire length, but you can put two inches, two inches, two inches, and that's enough. And keep a, skip a space. Uh, the dis distance between them is called the pitch. That's a term you need to remember. And there's, there's two types of intermittent welds, looking, fa looking down from above. You can have an intermittent weld that goes like this, and that is just called an intermittent weld. Or you could have an intermittent weld that goes like this, and that's called a staggered intermittent weld. So you go from one side to the next side to the next side, staggered intermittent. Uh, tack welds. Um, a fillet weld test is one that is given to tack welders because a tack welder generally is the person that is going to assist a fitter. Um, the fitter may be fitting things up and, and then the, the helper or the tack welder will sit there and put a little tack just to hold it in place. If they're working on code work, then that, that guy that's putting in tack weld still has to be certified. Uh, but he can be certified to a lower degree than, than the guy that's making the actual welds. Uh, stringer beads, everybody knows what a stringer bead is, weave bead, I'm sure by now you know what a weave bead is. Let's see, I don't think I have any slides on weld position. Um, so let's just read it real quickly. Weld positions, the flat position one, uh, you know, uh, you have flat, horizontal, vertical and overhead. Remember, if you're working in the vertical position, you have to designate, is it vertical up or vertical down? On page 136, plate designations, uh, 1G would be a flat groove, 2G, horizontal groove, 3G, vertical groove, 4G, overhead groove. Those are the positions you're working in now in this class. If it's pipe, you still go with the 1G, 2G, but now we have the 5G, which would be the horizontal fixed, the pipe is laying out horizontally and it can't move. That's why they call it horizontally fixed. Um, and then the 6G, which is the 45 degree angle, or uh, the slang term for that is in the Arkansas bell hole. 6GR is, you can look in figure 424, uh, look, at, look at number H, or letter H, and you see it's got a plate going around the weld. And usually that's, that'll be put about two inches from the weld, and it's called a restriction ring. So that would be that's 6GR, the R means restriction. They're making it tougher on you to pass a test because that's going to be in your way. Uh, that can, that's also referred to as a mock-up. Um, the plate positions, now you notice uh, here we have plate 1F, 2F, 3F, 4F. Of course, F means fillet weld, G means groove weld. So you can't just say the position, I'm welding in the, in the flat position. Or, or if you're describing a weld, I'm welding the 1G so they know it's a groove. Or I'm doing a 1F so they know it's a fillet. So uh, read those. Let's see. On the next page, 138, the bottom of the second paragraph re or second column reads, the welding position is an essential variable for the welder. If the welder is attempting to weld in a position that he or she is not qualified for, it will, be cause, it will cause the work to be being done to be rejected. When we take certification tests in this class, and this is the lowest certification we give, plate test certification, you'll have a chance to be certified here. Uh, if you do pass that test, we'll give you, give you the test in such a manner that you'll be certified to, to weld in all positions. But say you failed your overhead, okay? Well, we could still certify you to weld three positions, for example. But then if you got out there and you tried to weld overhead and you didn't have the proper credentials, anything you did would have to be cut out again because you weren't qualified. You did not pass that certification test. And that's what they're talking about here. Strength of welds. 
Read about uh, the strength of welds depends on several factors. The strength of the weld metal, the type of joint configuration. You're not going to weld, um, if, if you're welding with stuff, stuff that's, that's two inches thick, you're not going to weld with a, with a, with a uh, square groove because you can't weld much over a quarter inch thick. But you may weld a double bevel or, a do uh, pardon me, a, a, um, either a double, double V or a double U, something that will accommodate that thicker material. Type of weld, location of the joint in relation to the parts joined. The load condition, what is it going to be subjected to? Is it going to be put in a high heat environment or is it going to lay static in the ground? Uh, wh what, is, what is the welding process and the procedure? Is there any heat treatment involved? And then, of course, the skill of the welder. Some people, as I've mentioned before, are golden arms. They can pick up a welding rod and just weld the, the crack it on. Other people struggle day to day to, to master these skills. Um, in the next column, I highlighted this, it says the location of the welds in relation to the parts joined in many cases has an effect on the strength of the welded joint. Repeated tests reveal that when other factors are equal, welds having their linear dimension transverse, that is at right angles, to the lines of stress are approximately 10 to 15 percent stronger per unit average length than welds that have their linear dimensions parallel. And what they're meaning is if you look over on the next page at figure four, uh, 429, they've drawn us a little picture there, and I'll put it on the board. And all, they've, all they're showing us here is a, is a plate with a bar coming off of it. It kind of looks like a frying pan. And they put a couple of welds there. Uh, you can see that there's a welding symbol there with the uh, fillet weld, uh, weld symbol. And they've got a weld right here and then they've got a weld down the side. And they're telling us that the stress is this way. So this weld, because it is transverse to the applied load, is going to be stronger than this one because it's running with the stress created by the applied load. So if we had that out and we put, we set a bar that weighed a thousand pounds right there, this weld would, would support that weight better than this weld would. And that's what they're talking about. Okay, now let me go back to that slide that I had out of place. Drop down to where it says common weld and weld related discontinuities. Okay, highlight this in your book. I want you to know, it will be on your test, what a weld discontinuity is. Any interruption in the uniform nature of an item. Reading from your book, it says a weld discontinuity is any interruption in the normal flow of the structure of a, of a weldment. You have to keep in mind that when you're making these V-groove butt joints, you're joining two pieces of solid steel with welding rod, which should be solid steel when you're done. If it's not, that's an interruption in that solid steel nature of the weldment. That would be a discontinuity. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a defect. Discontinuities, these are some. Seams, laps, laminations, undercut, cracks, porosity, many others. These discontinuities become defects when they exceed allowable limits. A non-conforming discontinuity, meaning it doesn't conform to code standards. All discontinuities are not defects because some of them are allowed if they're within code. Porosity, for example. You can have porosity up to one-eighth of an inch per one inch. If it's less than that, you're okay. Uh, if it's more than that, or you have too, uh, uh, a cluster porosity, then you would exceed allowable limits, and that would become a defect then. So read about that. So know the difference between a discontinuity and a defect. It will be on your test. That's a promise. Now let's jump back through these things real quick. Um, fillet weld convexity. The maximum distance from the face of a convex fillet weld perpendicular to a line joining the weld toes. That's your throat. Uh, I think I got this. Uh, it's here on page 142, fillet welds with excess convexity. Read about, read about your fillet weld uh, uh, problems. I'm going I'm to concentrate mostly on groove welds here. Okay. Look on page 143 where it says groove weld profiles. 
groove weld with insufficient size. A decrease in size reduces the size of the butt weld. The thickness of the weld is less than the thickness of the plate, and the weld will not be as strong as the plate. Um, reading through your book, I would have called this underfill, and I'll get to underfill later on in this. Groove weld with excessive convexity, that means it's over-welded. You've, you've welded it too much. This is our definition. Uh, weld metal in excess of the quantity required to fill the joint. We've already had a number of examples on the board. Uh, the stress risers it can, it can create uh, by overwelding. Here's an example of it now. This is one that's been overwelded, and you can see that it didn't need to have this big old crown here, and certainly it didn't need to have this much fall through on the backside. So this is going to be excessive weld reinforcement causing stress risers. Uh, flip the page. Oh, I'm sorry, don't flip the page. We actually have to back up a little bit. Staying on page 143, porosity is the last item discussed in the first column. Porosity. It is a cavity-like discontinuity uh, formed by gas entrapment dur during solidification. What porosity is, it's hydrogen bubbles that, uh, that have gotten into your well pool. Um, hydrogen has an affinity for liquid metal. It tries to, it tries to suck it up like a sponge. I mean, it, it's really going to get in there if you allow it to. So if you're using 7018 and you're doing critical work, you want to make sure that these things have been heat stabilized. Get them out of the rod of them. Don't get them out of the can if you're having trouble with porosities. Long arcing is another way to allow porosity to get in there because you're going to be removing the shielding that is created by this flux as it burns off. A lot of ways to contaminate the weld with porosity. And our definition is cavity type discontinuities formed by gas and trapped during weld metal solidification. Looks like Swiss cheese. Here's some surface scattered porosity. You can see all these little bubbles along here. This is scattered porosity. Whoever welded this wasn't paying attention. And he didn't stop as soon as that porosity appeared. He kept on welding until he chipped the slag off and found all that porosity underneath. That entire weld would have had to have been cut out. Here's a crack connecting all these holes of porosity. Now, this was probably done with gas metal arc. And uh, again, he probably lost his shielding, which caused porosity, and then it was the, the plate itself was subjected to some kind of stress, which caused it to crack. Isolated surface porosity. So this may or may not be a defect. It depends on whether or not the code that this weld was made to uh, allows these things to be a certain size or a certain amount per square inch. This is probably a defect, but I want to point that out to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be if the code would allow it. This is elongated surface porosity. We used to call these wormholes. A lot of times they'll be associated, if you dug down and dug this base metal away here, you might find slag back in there. So a lot of times that kind of porosity is associated with slag. This is what it looks like on an x-ray. Scattered porosity. It might be a little hard to see, but here's some, here's some, here's some, on down through here. Now this is an x-ray of, of a weld that might very well be within code. It has some porosity in it, but it's not really excessive. So if this was going to be a weld that was going to be made and, and they're going to bury it in the ground and it's just going to carry 100 pounds of pressure, this might be acceptable. This one, on the other hand, would not be acceptable. This is cluster porosity. It's called cluster porosity, and you can see, as the name implies, there's a whole bunch of porosity in a very small area. What that does, if, if it's a pressure retaining pipe, it gives a path for that pressure to escape. You've reduced, each one of those bubbles reduces the through thickness of the weld metal, and so a crack is possible. And of course, it will give a path then for, for the, whatever is being retained in that pressure piping to escape. So no cluster porosity is allowed. So this one definitely would be a failure. Um, Again, my, you'll have to forgive me, my slides are out of order a little bit. I threw this one in here. This is what I drew on the board earlier when I was talking about excessive weld reinforcement. Um, here they've got too much weld reinforcement, and you can see the angle. This causes their stress riser. So to fix it, this is the improper technique. They just ground off the cap. They just took a grinder and knocked the top of that off. But they didn't do anything to address that angle there. See? So here, this was properly done. They, they, re, they reduced that angle, 
and, and uh, just kind of cushioned it a little bit. They radiused it a little bit so that it would, it would flow smoothly. This is what I was doing on the board. So you, if, you're gonna, if you have excessive weld reinforcement and you're told to fix it because it causes a stress riser, you can't just take a grinder and knock off the top. You've got to kind of uh, uh, form it. You've got to shape it a little bit. Okay, now we're back to where we should be. Page 144, undercut. We only have about three pages to go here in your book. Undercut, know what undercut is. A groove melted into the base metal adjacent to the weld toe or weld root and left unfilled by weld metal. This would be the appearance. When you were doing T-joints, you would have had something like this probably on the top side of your, of, of your weld. What you're in now, 1840, you're liable to get this on the back side or on the front side. If it's on the back side, it's probably associated with your rod angle. Your rod angle may not be correct or you may be running too hot. Here's a picture of, of x-ray, of, of undercut. You should be able to find that with a flashlight. You just hold a flashlight up against it and it'll, hold, it'll cast a shadow. Overlap is our next one. Read about overlap. Understand what overlap is. The protrusion of weld metal beyond the weld toe or the weld root. Um, and what it does, these are the, this is the same picture, but now they're showing us the overlap. What it does is it's weld metal that is, that's not needed. It's flowed out too far, and it's just basically laying on the weld metal. You can see that the fusion stopped right here. So this, this other stuff shouldn't even be there. So that is the stress riser. And here it's run down. There are some codes that if you had any of that on the inside of pipe, you're gone. Get your lunch pail. You're out of there. And here's some on the outside of the weld. Totally uncalled for. Overlap. Not allowed. Cracks. A fracture type discontinuity characterized by a sharp tip and high ratio of length and width to opening displacement. This is considered the most severe type of discontinuity. I'm going to read this from your book now. It says, a crack is a fracture type discontinuity that has a sharp tip and a length much greater than its width or opening. In most codes or specification, cracks of any length, location, or orientation are not allowed. In this case, all cracks would be defects and must be repaired. If you flip the page, uh, it says, because they have sharp tips, cracks are considered a stress riser. They can also propagate. That means they can grow. They can spread. They can spread rapidly across the joint or the weldment. Cracks can be generally be classified as hot cracks or cold cracks. Insufficient ductility at high temperatures will cause high crack, or hot cracks. These cracks move between grains in the weld metal or at the weld interface. If cracks occur once the metal uh, has solidified, then they are considered cold cracks. The weld metal, heat affected zone, or base metal can be affected by cold cracks. Cold cracks occur because of improper welding procedure or techniques or the welding service conditions. Um, we're going to get into, into cracks and defects much, much more thoroughly when, we, when you take uh, welding inspection technology. But this is just kind of something to give you a heads up. And you may hear about cracks on your test. I'll just about bet you will. So there's a number of them. Hot and cold cracks, delayed underbead, longitudinal transverse, throat, toe, root, heat affected zone, base metal, and many more types of cracks. I'm just going to talk about a few of them here. This is a toe crack. And this is a, a micrograph. They cut this weld, etched it, and you can see, look, here's the crack running down from the toe on both sides. That's, that's a toe crack in the heat affected zone, right? Here's a throat crack. It's also called a longitudinal crack because it's running the length of the weld. This is a crater crack in aluminum. Well, they call this a star crack. That's where they stopped welding. The same thing happens with, with, with any kind of a welding rod that you're using. You can create a star crack if you don't properly terminate the, the weld, the bead. And then here, this is the propagation that they're talking about. Here they, they had a crack start right here in this star crack where they, where they terminated went around and, and just a little vibration caused it to go all the way around that weldment and the whole thing cracked out. Here are under bead cracks. Let's talk about under bead cracks. Um, okay, 
Hydrogen cracking, highlight this. Hydrogen cracking is also referred to as delayed cracking. Uh, in certain situations, inspection will be delayed for up to several days to let this type of crack manifest itself. Some material that you weld, those cracks won't appear until long after you've made the weld. So a lot of times that stuff has to be inspected days or even weeks after the weld is done. Cracking of this nature is brought about by one of the following four items. The presence of hydrogen, hard grain structures, amount of restraint in the joint, low temperature operation of weldment. Hydrogen is a form of moisture that can come from many sources. Water, moisture, uh, any lubricants, grease, the sweat off your palms, paint, hydrogen gets in there. And what happens here, these under bead cracks, and I don't think I have anything that specifically addresses under bead cracks, but under bead cracks are hydrogen cracks. What happens is that hydrogen, two molecules or two, two atoms of, of hydrogen join together to form a molecule. And then those molecules are too big to nestle in the, in the weld grain boundary. So it exerts stress on, on the, the uh, parent metal until it just cracks. The one remedy for that is to allow it to precipitate out. You can post weld heat treat that and that may stop it from happening. Reading from your book here, I'm in the second column, the last uh, near the last uh, part of that part on hydrogen says, this type of cracking is usually found in the heat affected zone. These cracks may not open to the surface initially, so they are sometimes called under bead cracks. Uh, this makes them difficult to locate and is why final inspection may be delayed to allow the crack to propagate to the surface. So know the term under bead crack. Under bead cracking is often delayed, caused by hydrogen, difficult to, de to detect, and you can avoid it somewhat using whole, uh, low hydrogen electrodes. Okay, incomplete fusion is next. Read about that. Incomplete fusion is a weld discontinuity in which fusion did not occur between weld metal and fusion faces or adjoining weld beads. It, uh, sometimes it, it, it emulates overlap too. All it's doing is the weld metal simply laying on, on a surface. It didn't fuse into it. Here's some examples. You're doing V grooves right now, so you can, here's, here's some voids in the weld metal where they didn't, didn't fuse everything in. There's certain things that can account for that, so read your text and understand what could cause that. Incomplete fusion, incomplete fusion, incomplete fusion at the toe. Here's a picture of it. They didn't melt th this edge. Incomplete fusion. Uh, this is an x-ray of in incomplete fusion. Um, that some, th this type of a shot can sometimes be misinterpreted as slag inclusions. Incomplete joint penetration, I want to read from your book. Incomplete joint penetration occurs when the weld metal does not extend all the way into the root of the joint. If the weld metal penetrates the root but does not fuse, then it is referred to as incomplete fusion. Incomplete joint penetration may ca be caused by not dissolving surface oxides or impurities, but most generally it is due not, uh, to not applying sufficient heat to the arc. So, incomplete joint penetration, Weld metal does not extend entirely through the joint thickness. The term is used only for groove welds. So we won't, you won't hear this when we're talking about fillet welds. Here's some examples. Now, this, this uh, I said I'd come back to talk about partial, point, partial joint penetration welds later on, and now I shall. These can also be, if these were designed, these would be called partial joint penetration welds. Uh, sometimes they engineer them that way because they don't need to go all the way through. But when the intention is that they be complete joint penetrations, then these would be defects because they, you didn't penetrate all the way through. And here, there's no reason to have incomplete joint penetration on a weld that you're going to do a back weld on or anything like that because you would generally gouge it out until you got back into sound metal and then complete that. Uh, here's what you may see in, in the work you're doing. This is a single V groove and they didn't quite break everything down. This is not uncommon at all, especially if you're, if you're working in... Uh, out of position welds. Uh, this is hard to check. If you had to do a, a, a single um, bevel, this is bevel and a bevel, uh, on something like this, you, to make sure you had complete joint penetration, you would weld one side and then gouge out the other side before you applied that second joint or that second weld to make sure you had complete penetration. Now here's, a, here's an x-ray of, of one on the side and then here's a picture of it. Here, this was a partial penetration joint, 
and they're using this to illustrate incomplete joint penetration. And you can see there's a void in here. Uh, this edge right here where, where this metal just kind of ran down the face, that could also be termed uh, incomplete fusion because it didn't fusion to the parent metal. And then you can see it's a very distinctive appearance on an x-ray. Um, partial joint penet uh, penetration, this is uh, a definition of a penetration not required to be complete by the designer. Before I get to inclusions, there's one other thing I want to point out. Come down about uh, halfway to the bottom of the page and it says, in, uh, I'm still talking about incomplete joint penetration. This continuity is generally not acceptable in most codes or specifications. No amount of incomplete penetration is generally allowed, so it is considered a defect which must be repaired. There are exceptions to that. The API 1104 code allows some uh, incomplete joint penetration in their code. So I would remember that that may be on your test. Inclusions. In trapped foreign materials such as slag, flux, tungsten, or oxide, so you get slag inclusions, you trap some slag in the weld. Here's a picture of it, here's some surface slag inclusions. This is what they look like on, on an x-ray. This is why I say sometimes that other, that other x-ray is confused with these. These are called wagon tracks. And these, you see how bright and white these are? These are tungsten inclusions. Tungsten shows up bright white like that because uh, they're, they're more dense than the surrounding base metal. And so less x-rays penetrate them to get to the film, and therefore the film remains white. Underfill. Um, Read about, read about this in your book. Basically, the guy just didn't fill it up all the way. A condition in which the weld face or root surface is below the adjacent surface of the base metal. Here's a picture of it. It's, it's hard to make out, but here it's still, it's sunk in. It's sunk in because uh, in, in, in a T-joint, this would be called concavity. But here the guy simply didn't fit, complete the weld. He didn't fill it up all the way. So read about that. Then finally, I talked about the criticality a little bit already. Uh, cracks are the most critical because they are linear. They have a sharp end condition. Uh, they're exposed to the surface typically. And the lo loading, whether it's uniform or non-uniform loading, would have some, some effect on how critical the discontinuity is. Whoop! Put that in upside down, didn't I? Um, I'm on page 148 now. This is where they talk about the criticality of the defect. Read about that. Over in the next column, uh, understand and make a point of this. Uh, inspection of the weld is your responsibility. You need to inspect it before you begin the weld, while you're welding, and after you complete the weld. Before, during, and after. Remember that. Before, during, and after. So that means you're going to make sure that the joint is properly prepared, properly cleaned. Uh, you've taken some of that mill scale back off so you don't suck any of it into the weld. While you're welding, you're going to inspect every pass. You're going to look for undercut. You're going to look to see if you have any slag trapped back in undercut. Watch that. You're going to make sure you don't over weld whenever you put the cap on. When you're all done, you're going to clean it up. Uh, I was going to show you arc strikes here, but, but it's upside down. A definition of arc strikes. Well, arc strikes, where you drag that welding rod across the face of the metal, that's a discontinuity. You can't see it very well. Well, just ignore what it says down here, and you can kind of see it pretty good. This is, this is an arc strike. And this was, it's been blown up, and you can see all these little cracks propagating out from that arc strike. That's what happens whenever you drag your welding rod across the face of that metal. So you want to avoid arc strikes if you can. And I put this over again, too. Uh, here's spatter. Spatter is another thing that you want to look for. Why? Because spatter is sometimes hot enough to cause cracks. Look at this. Not only, there's a crack running all the way across there. Not only is uh, spatter unsightly, it can cause cracks. And if, it, if that part's got to be painted afterwards, then, then there's more cleanup problems. So monitor yourself. Um, I've seen people run off because they were sloppy welders. Okay, let's see. The only other things that I want to mention here is uh, there's a picture there of an inspection kit. I have these. Those of you that take welding inspection technology uh, later on will work with those. They've come, up, come out with new handheld weld scanners that will just, if you can just wave this thing over a weld and it will 
It will digitally take all those measurements for you. Uh, they sound pretty neat. What I want you to pay attention to and highlight is the very last paragraph in this, on, on this page. It says, visual inspection, abbreviated VI, by the welder can be a very effective tool in controlling overall weld quality. Uh, although visual inspection is limited to the surface of welds only, it is understood that the external surfaces of weldments see the highest stresses in service. Discontinuities opening to the surface are considered to be critical to the overall weldment fitness for the intended purpose. Visual inspection is cost effective and it's easy to perform by trained personnel. It can uncover most of the major defects by just simply looking at it. Uh, this method allows for the discovery and repair of defects as they may occur so that if you put in a, a weld and you see it's bad, you can fix it right there before you put in the next weld. It is easy to see the importance and efficiency of discovering and correcting a defect as early in the welding operation as possible. So once again, you're your own best inspector. Um, get into the habit of monitoring your work and doing it as well as you can. That's it for that chapter, and I thank you for your attention.